So now we actually got to the letter in Revelation to the church of Philadelphia. So we're going to read starting from Revelation chapter 3, verse 7, and see this letter that Jesus writes to this church and what he has to say to the church of brotherly love. So starting in Revelation chapter 3, verse 7, it reads, To the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth, and no man shutteth, and shutteth, and no man openeth. So as we've already said, Philadelphia means brotherly love. And brotherly love is a specific and essential characteristic of the true Christian church. There is no separation. Oh, I don't like that person. You don't like this person. I don't like those group. I don't like this. I don't like that. No, we love one another. Jesus tells us that love is the distinguishing factor. It's the distinguishing feature of the church. That's how the world's going to know that we belong to him. Peter, John, and Paul all say the exact same thing. So in John 13, 34, Jesus says, a new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love one to another. That means if you annoy the tarnation out of me, for a country's phrase right there, if you annoy me to know it, I can still love you. I don't always have to like you but I have to love you. And even if someone is my enemy, I have to love them. And I have to share with them the good news of Jesus Christ. That's the distinguishing feature of the Christian, of the church. That's what makes it effective. In John chapter 15, verse 12 says, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. He said it over and over. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 22, seeing you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren. See that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. I mean, push yourself to love one another. Love is not an emotion. It's an act of will. It's something you do despite what your emotions may want you to do, right? And that's true for not just in the church, but even within marriage sometimes. And within the family relationships, uh, love is a feature that we are supposed to put on display, something we're supposed to do even when we don't want to. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 23, John says, and this is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ. All right, we know that. And love one another as he gave us commandment. Look how highly John puts love. Second only to accepting the Christ, accepting Christ as Savior. Do you feel like that's the feature of the churches today? Sadly, not the majority of them, right? The majority of the churches very sorely lack it. It would be a rare church that fulfilled it. In Romans chapter 13, verse 8, what's Paul have to say? Owe no man anything but to love one another. That's all you can owe each other is love one another. For he that loveth another has fulfilled the law. I mean, imagine, do I need to know, don't cheat, don't steal, obey my parents, don't covet? If I just loved others, wouldn't I already do all those things? It fulfills the law. The next thing we notice here, aside from the love that we have, this church of brotherly love in the title, we then see Jesus' introduction of himself. These things saith he that is holy and he that is true. Jesus introduces himself as holy and true. This is Jesus Christ introducing himself as God Almighty. When Jesus walked to the earth, a man came up to him and asked him, Hey, how, good master, how do I get to heaven? And Jesus responded saying, Why are you calling me good? That's in Luke 18, verse uh, 18 and 19 says, A certain ruler asked him saying, Good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? None is good save one that is God. Now notice, Jesus then goes on, but he never denies that he is good, but he says only God is good. Well, Jesus right here says, I am holy and I am true. I am good. Holiness requires perfection. Perfection is only attained by God. 
and by Jesus Christ because he is God in the flesh. This is yet another identification of Jesus Christ as God. And what does he do with his holiness and his righteousness? He gives it to us. He takes our place so that we can have his place as children of God. We are made holy because he is holy, not because there's any holiness within us naturally. First Peter chapter one, verse 15 and 16 read, but he, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. The only thing that makes me holy is that Jesus Christ has poured his blood and washed me clean. That's it. And that's the only thing that makes us holy. So, so Jesus is God and he died for us. So Jesus is holy. The Father is holy. And the Holy Spirit, in the name even, is holy. What did the angels say when they stand before God? Holy, holy, holy. Exactly. Isaiah 6, 3. And he cried one unto another, said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. In Revelation chapter 4, verse 8. The four beasts had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day nor night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which out was and is and is to come. So the angels are always crying, Holy, 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 praising the Trinity, praising God Almighty. So the messenger, this message that came from Jesus, he's holy and he's true. Then he says, I have the key of David. That's kind of interesting. He says directly, um, he, he that hath the key of David. Well, you know, Jesus, if he's the one that holds the key, he holds the key of David. And where is that described in the Bible? We find it in Isaiah. Exactly. Right. Isaiah 22. And more importantly, he also holds the keys of hell and death from Revelation 118. And, and so when we think about Isaiah 22, we read about the transfer of of the key of David, the keys of David, from a man named Shebna to a man named Eliakim, okay? So Shebna, the treasurer, or Shebna, the treasurer, is being replaced by Eliakim under the king Hezekiah. He tells them, right? So we tell them that all authority is going to be given to uh, Eliakim, right? And the treasurer, and he's going to be robed. He's going to be given the king's outfit, the king's robe. He's going to wear the king's apparel, right? This is what the authority being given to this new guy. So what do we know of Shebna? Well, he was someone first appointed to a very high position over all of Israel. As we read in Isaiah 22, 15, he says, Thus saith the Lord God of hosts, Go get thee unto this treasurer, even unto Shebna, which is over the house, and say, What hast thou here, and whom hast thou there, that thou hast hewed thee out a sepulchre here? He is he that heweth at him out a sepulchre on high, and that graveth a habitation for himself in a rock. He had authority over everything, and he had everything prepared for him to stay in power for good. He put his sepulchre, he had his place where he's going to be buried in a position of power, and his family is going to stay in power. Then what's he saying in verse 17? He says, Behold, the Lord will carry thee away with a mighty captivity and will surely cover thee. He will surely violently turn and toss thee like a ball into a large country. Never know God played basketball, did you? He's going to throw this guy like a ball into, a, into, a, <laughs> into a, this mighty captivity in this large country, and there thou shalt die. And there the chariots of thy glory, all this glory that you had, shall be the shame of thy Lord's house. Everyone's going to look at you and laugh. You're going to be ashamed whenever you had all your glory taken away. And I will drive thee from thy station and from thy state shall he pull thee down. So in a sense here, Shebna was appointed a place of power and authority, but because of his pride, because of his disobedience, right? What happened to him? He fell and he was carried away by the Lord and to utter destruction. Does that sound like anyone else we've ever heard of? Does it ring a bell about anyone else we know? Well, I, well, Lucifer is what I'm going for. Yeah. <laughs> Isaiah 14, verse 13 says, For thou hast said in thine heart, 
I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above all the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Yet you shall be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. These are the words of the king of Babylon, understood to be Satan or Lucifer, right? So Shebna, in a sense, is picturing Satan, who was given this position of power, but was prideful and rebellious and was brought down low and sent into judgment. So who's going to replace Shebna? He's going to be replaced by a new steward of the key with the keys of David. The replacement is named Eliakim. Eliakim means, it's a name, which means whom God shall raise up. The one whom God shall raise up. There was a promised prophet in the Old Testament. Okay. When Moses was around, there was a prophet that was promised that God's going to raise up to free Israel. So in Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 15, he says, the Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee, of thy brethren, like unto me. Unto him you shall hearken. So they were waiting for that promised prophet, the one whom God shall raise up. That was the term. They were waiting for their Eliakim, right? So, the, of course, the one who God raised up is Jesus Christ. In Acts chapter 3, 22, they actually quote Moses to tell us who it was. It says, for Moses truly said unto the fathers, a prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me. Him shall you hear in all things whatsoever he shall say unto you. And then down in verse 26, it says, Unto you first God, having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from his iniquities. So that's the one whom God raised up. So then what else do we learn about this Eliakim, this guy who's going to get the keys, who gets the keys? Well, we read in Isaiah 22, verse 20. And it shall come to pass in that day that I will call my servant Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, and I will clothe him with thy robe and strengthen him with thy girdle. And I will commit the government into his hand. The government will be, let's just say, on his shoulders. And he shall be a father, right? An everlasting father, perhaps, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. Now, don't make any mistake. Eliakim was a real guy who actually was given a stewardship. But the symbolism of Jesus Christ is clearly here, right? He's going to take away the robe and the girdle, and the government's going to be placed in his hands, and he will be a father to all of Israel. Does that bring to you any other memory of any other verse? In Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, For unto us a child is born, for unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting father, again, proving Jesus is God, the prince of peace. And then we continue Isaiah 22, verse 22, more about this Eliakim. And the key of the house of David will I lay upon his shoulder. So he shall open and none shall shut and he shall shut and none shall open. You remember those verses from this letter mm -hmm. talking about how when God opens a door, none will shut it. Yeah. So he will receive the key of the house of David on his shoulder. Now, again, if no one shuts, this reminds us of Revelation 3, 7. It says, these things say, he that is holy, he that is true, he that has the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. So then we continue, verse 23 of Isaiah 22. And I will fasten him. Uh-oh. What's going to happen to this Eliakim? I will fasten him as a nail in a sure place. Doesn't sound so good. And he shall be for a glorious throne to his father's house. And they shall hang upon him all the glory of his father's house, the offspring and the issue for the descendants. All vessels of small quantity and the, from the vessels of cups, even to the vessels of flagons or specifically wine. So he's going to be fastened as a nail in a sure place. This is somehow going to be a glorious thing. So in John chapter 12, verse 27, he says, Now is my soul troubled, Jesus speaking. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this cause, I came unto this hour. Father, glorify thy name. You need to fasten me as a nail in a short place. 
to bring glory to you? And they're going to hang all the glory upon me? Yes, your will. Then uh, came a voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. And what do we glorify in? Do we glorify in the second coming of Christ? No, we glorify in the cross of Christ when he was fastened as a nail in a sure place for my sins. Galatians 6.14 reads, God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. That's our only glory. We look forward to the second coming, but that's not what saved my soul. It's Jesus dying on the cross for my sin, right? So what will be hung on him? Again, all the glory of his father's house and all the offspring and the descendants will be hung on the fact that he was fastened in a short place. John chapter 1, verse 12, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. So then we go on in Isaiah 22 about this Eliakim, but there's something else that happens. He's not going to stay fastened forever. In that day, saith the Lord of hosts, shall the nail that is fastened in the sure place be removed. He won't always be on that cross and be cut down and fall. And the burden that was upon it shall be cut off for the Lord has spoken. Up. Jesus did not remain on the cross. The nail has been removed. The burden has been cut off. So the position meant Eliakim and he alone could grant access to the throne. He's the only one that could let you into the throne room. This speaks volumes. You could probably do a whole sermon on Shebna and Eliakim. If you want access to heaven, there is only one that has the keys, and not only has the keys, who is the door. John chapter 10, verse 7 says, Then said Jesus unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. And then in verse 9, I am the door. By him, by me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. So the only key to heaven the key to heaven is what? To us? It's been given to us, right? We know the key to heaven. It's Jesus Christ. He gave the keys to heaven to Peter by revealing what? That Jesus is the Christ. He's the Messiah. Peter shared that key with the Jews at Pentecost and the Gentiles at the house of Cornelius, and we're still sharing it today. In Matthew 16, 16, Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art Christ, the Son of the living God. And in verse 19 says, and I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. You have the keys to eternal life. Everyone here, if you've accepted Jesus Christ and you know what he did for you on the cross, you have the key to let anyone who will receive that come find Jesus and enter into eternal life with him. So Paul and Peter and the other apostles, they shared those keys with the rest of the world. They opened that door and they left it open through the words that we've recorded, not we've recorded, but God has recorded in the Bible, right? And Jesus, of course, is the key to salvation. He is holy. He is true. He can be trusted. He delights in keeping his promises. You don't need anyone, anyone besides Jesus Christ to open the door for you. The key is the blood of Christ, which was already shed for our sins. Accept it. I'm not saying you can't go to your pastor and preacher and your Bible study leader and your friend that's a Christian or your family member. Yes, go to them. Talk to them about Jesus. But it is only Jesus that can give you eternal life. Accept it. That is why the Bible can state clearly, whomsoever will shall be saved. It's on you. He did, what, he did the work. You just have to accept it. And this is just a side note where we kind of take a little break here. The other keys in the Bible. So we have the key of the house of David from Isaiah 22, which we read. We have the key of David, which we read about here in Revelation chapter 3, verse 7. Uh, we have the key of knowledge, which is in Luke chapter 11, verse 52, where he's criticizing the teachers of the law that you guys have the keys of knowledge and you refuse to let anyone use them. The key to the bottomless pit, which we'll talk about in Revelation chapter 9, 
in chapter 20. It's in chapter 9, verse 1, and chapter 20, verse 1. We have the keys of the kingdom of heaven, which we mentioned here in Matthew 16, 19, and the keys of hell and death, which was in Revelation 1, 18. And here's the secret. Jesus is the keeper of the keys, every one of them, right? So with that being said, that uh, sums up verse 7.